My name is Oracle, and I'm with the website MikeGoddess.com. I'm James. I'm just the, the tech guy for the track. <laughs> but occasionally I'll throw something on the track. You make everything happen. It's an I, important job. Make yeah. sure it keeps happening. Yeah. Happens, Techies are important. My name is Ken Spivey. I run the largest Doctor Who convention in Florida, Time Work Fest. And I also uh, am the lead singer of the Ken Spivey Band, which is performing tomorrow at 2.30. And what, where are we performing, Allison? Crystal Ballroom. Crystal Ball. Grand Ballroom. Grand Ballroom West in the Hilton. Hilton. In the Hilton Ballroom. It's a big room. So we're the steampunk Doctor Who Band. And the reason why I'm here leading the Stargate panel is that one of my undergraduate degrees was in gender theory, and I led several courses on it. And Jennifer, who is the track director, uh, knows that I want to talk about that. So she allows me to lead a few panels discussing, like, today relationships. Uh, Monday we're discussing uh, martial, uh, weird tooths, martial masculinity in Stargate. How come a woman has to hold, literally, a staff to be, a, to be considered uh, masculine on the show? So today we're discussing relationships. It's not just making love, it's how people interact. So let's go at a very basic level right now. Let's compare and contrast uh, two characters from two of the shows. Let's compare and contrast um, Samantha Carter and uh, was it Talia? Talia from Atlantis, was it? Taylor. 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 I always forget her name because I try to. Taylor. Okay. How do you compare and contrast Taylor and Samantha Carter? Samantha, it, well, <clears throat> she is a woman in a uh, in a man's world, basically. She's a female soldier. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that she's constantly trying to prove herself. Yeah. And she has no problem doing that because she's pretty badass. Um, Taylor is more of a, I guess, utilitarian. She's trying to help her people and trying to do what's right for her people. So. Yes. Isn't Taylor kind of the same thing, though? I mean, as far as like a, a woman in a man's world being a leader where it's not typical for, I mean, women to be as much of a leader in her culture as well? Well, uh, I, I have an interesting take on Taylor. Uh, it's Taylor, right? Yeah. yeah I, I, sorry, I just really don't like your character. <laughs> um, for one thing, is that every single woman on that show has the same blouse for five years. I don't understand, like, like Weir has the red blouse of authority, and, <laughs> and, like, and she's not even her rank. She's just like, how can we make her look feminine and strong? Well, we got this at Bell's, let's have her wear that. Um, looks good, sure, stick with it. We saved on the budget. Okay. Taylor, she had such potential. She came from a warrior culture. And many times in the show, they had a chance where they could have allowed her innate wisdom, because we saw how incredibly powerful it was to be equal to that of the scientific knowledge and the academic knowledge of the other characters. With wisdom taken in that regard, you could say that it just her understanding of concepts and of, and of reality itself, if they had a medical problem or a scientific problem, she could hear the basic concepts and give a very elegant solution based on her innate wisdom. That only happened maybe once or twice. Instead, she became a very uh, a feminized, weakened character. And eventually, uh, Jason Momoa came on and became what she was supposed to be. So, <sighs> Yes, she almost was Samantha Carter, but they didn't give, she had all the capability and, and the potential to be a Samantha Carter, but in my opinion, they didn't know how to write her character. Like, how do you make somebody, if we're playing D&D, whose skill set is really high in wisdom and really high intellect, but, uh, but very low in like, charisma? Because even though she was an attractive woman, people didn't really relate well to her. So that was my major issue with her, is that they never wrote the character well. Uh, her romantic relationship, I think she had like one or two, made no sense. What, what, what was the point of her in the show other than to walk around and essentially be the Native American spirit guide who will walk up and say like, don't put glitter on the ground. That's all I got out of her. 
Samantha Carter we saw grow. In the first season, we saw her give the uh, wonderful speech that I'm more than my private parts. Everybody remembers this speech. Over time, she became more than just somebody who holds a staff weapon. She became a, a, a character in her own right. Once we got past the weird episode with uh, where, where everybody had to use their sex powers, overpower the ghoul that, that used her sex powers, even, <laughs> or even though I enjoyed it quite a bit, uh, it, my eyes are glued to the screen, it's great. Um, I, I didn't see, it didn't help her character much. I think I really saw her come into her own oddly when Daniel left. When Daniel left, someone had to fill in that intellectual and authoritative void. And I believe that's when she finally came into her own. Unfortunately, but close to when she was fading away from the series. So bearing that in mind, around that same moment, I just, I, I believe her relationship with the replicator. Do you remember this? That was amazing. And that where I'm leading all this to is, why did it work? The re replicator relationship with Samantha Carter. I want to open this up to the panelists first. Why did that one specific relationship, why was, at least to me, I don't know if it was to you, why was that believable? I wish I had something eloquent to say here. I mean, it, it, it was, but kind of because of everything that came before it and how they established her character and yeah. well, what about writing. <laughs> what are your thoughts here? Well, I mean, part of, part of a, a relationship is having to get to know the person, some back and forth interchange of information. Yeah. The replicator, he got to stick like his hand in her head and see everything. So he knew all the facts about her. It was just trying to get that emotional connection. And he was the only one out of the group of those replicators that had those proper emotions. And I think that's part of where that came in. Well, it was following a similar theme to her relationship with the Tokra uh, that. I'm going to open this up to the, the, the audience. Do you believe that due to her strength and her station in the Stargate Command and in the world, that she realized that she would never do well in an actual relationship and that she was attracted to doomed relationships because that's the only place that was safe so she could still maintain who is Samantha Carter and still be in a relationship? Or is there another reason why she was attracted to these doomed relationships? Alone among all of the people, and had to stay alone to have her power. Yeah. And that's how I saw with the Tokra and with the replicators. So and being al being alone it isn't that a traditionally masculine trait. So she was yet again trying to uh, to hold on to masculinity to, to maintain any sort of power in that world. It is. Yes. I'm not sure she really wanted a relationship and that's probably why she was attracted to the ones that wouldn't work yeah. uh, because as she's, she's innately alone um, and she does best alone and she probably and you know of course you feel lonely at times and you do want that companionship but I, yeah I think she realized that she I'm not sure she ever realized but I think it was just a regular companionship wouldn't work with her line of duty. Actually, she talks about it several times. I believe there's even an episode where she pretty bluntly says, I don't go for relationships that might be successful because of what she's doing. She doesn't trust that it'll it'll work out and it'll be good. And yeah. Um, just recently, so the captain's Shatner done, mm -hmm. and he was interviewing Kate Mulgren, uh, mm -hmm. the, the female captain, and the, one of the questions was, in real life, you were so successful, uh, and then you had kids, and then if you would be a diff definitely a captain, how the relations with, um, how the relations will work out? And the basic response was, it's will not. From her, it was, it's impossible, because um, you can, you can the, the family taking so much, Feminine role, or at least in our understanding, is such that it's taken so much time 
to to support the family, to get on the family. That uh, uh, and again, it's not right or wrong. It's ease. It's like how we are living right now. Okay. Um, if I, if I'm it's impossible to, to, to do yeah. both. Yeah. Okay. If, I'm understanding, one or another. if I'm understanding you correctly, basically what you're saying is that society expects that if a woman has a baby, she takes care of that baby and thus she can no longer be a starship captain. It's not only society, it's 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 like uh it's 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 never never it's biological basically. It's biological because the woman is tend to care for her children more I, than, than the male. I think she might attempt you. I, you I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would argue that that point a little bit um, because, well, yes, from a certain biological oh, standpoint. Hold on a second. Before we go any further, let, uh, on a Stargate panel, it's really easy to start to talk about Stargate. I mean, Star Trek. Let's try to keep everything Stargate. Yeah, Just right. let's 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 not talk about the dynamic of the Starfleet cast. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah, but, right. but that's a great yeah. example. Okay. Okay. Good. Yeah. Um, because I think there's a trap that some people fall into. Because really, our gender roles are completely assigned by society. They start from when you are two years old, and people start buying girls' pink dresses and buying boys' action figures. And um, but. Yes, if we're living in a tribal society, the bare necessity of a woman produces milk does require the baby to spend more time with her. But barring that, ever since humans started congregating in groups, even if you go back hundreds and hundreds of years, there would be women who were maybe poor and thus relied to be the primary caregiver for the baby. But if you were a rich woman, you had a wet nurse. You went out and you did whatever you wanted to, and the poor woman you paid was the one that stayed with your baby and nursed it. So the fact that a woman cannot do anything in life except take care of the baby is a society construct. It's my best friend. It's a social construct. My best friend, in fact, uh, his wife actually works for the uh, district attorney uh, in Florida, and she's a rather successful attorney, and uh, she uh, just had her second child. He's the stay-at-home dad. And that was his dream in life, to be a stay-at-home daddy. And he's on leave right now from his company. He took the maternity leave. It, there were, it, you could make a very weak case that there's a biological imperative that a woman is the one who is the, the, the more nurturing. In reality, it, it's, it's who, who truly is the, uh, the nurturing one. Uh, by, if we're going with Starfleet, I'm sure by then it's like bajillion years in the future, I'm sure that by then we've all read Foucault and we understand that gender is fluid. I mean, like, you know, it's probably an oldie by then. Uh, on Stargate, at no point have we uh, truly seen uh, the military treat men and women that differently. Yet yeah, you're an officer, that's your job. So if she had a baby, well, take care of it. Like. Like, well, you can't come to work today because your kid's sick. Okay, where's daycare? Like, you've got a job to do. You've got work. I mean, it, it, whatever uh, women experience equality is, unfortunately, is part of a uh, uh, feminist backlash, is that if you truly uh, want to step up to the plate and, and be equal to a man on all accounts, you have to be accountable. You need a wife. Yeah, you need a wife, yeah. I would say she did have an incredible relationship with Cassandra in the series, but she did not want to have that as her entire life. She yes. wanted to be part of that, but she did not want to be a mother. She wanted to be part of someone's life, but not fully in that. And, and that's okay. And I mean, it's okay if a woman does exactly. want to have a baby and stay exactly. yeah. But it's okay if she doesn't want to. I have a friend who, she when, they, to be a badass when they person. had a baby, he was the stay-at-home dad because she has a better job. And even when she was breastfeeding, she would come home over lunch. She would go back to work. You know, and he he took on the primary caregiver because that's worked for them. I want to hear more about your. Why don't you come up closer? I want to hear more about your comment about she needs a wife well, about same-sex relationships in Stargate. Well, no, it's just that wives get all the stuff that let men do what they need to I, do. That's why they can focus now because they their job. I think yeah. when she says wife, she doesn't necessarily mean the gender. Could she means the yeah. person that stays at home and cooks and Male cleans. sex, anybody who takes care of the stuff you have to do, but if you have a career-type job, if you have a job job, generally they'll look at you slack. You're not critical, mission critical. But if you have one of those career-type jobs, you're supposed to be there 60 to 100 hours a week. And you're either not going to, you know, not make it up the ladder or whatever. That you need support staff. So, so even if the rock wife is hired, you need someone in that position. Rich people never raise their own children. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
They, oh. they hired, uh, what do you call them, the wet nurses? And people yeah. who nurses. Their own. And I wet nurses. nurses. Yeah, wet nurses. Wet nurses. Nannies. Like you know, the people who had stuff to do. So, so they raise their own children. So a, a stay at home personal assistant. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, if you like to or raise you your children, it's great, because raising good good yeah. children is very important. I, I, a friend of mine says that she thinks the military and parenthood should be all volunteer. And I think that's very true. Because if you don't, you know, if you have parents who aren't there for you, you will not, you know, somebody's not there for you. Yeah, you will somebody's not there for you. A well-rounded person. So that's, that's extremely critical. Well, My only view is if you have children, somebody damn well better be taking care of them well. And Pete could have done that. <laughs> and, and that will probably be my husband, because he is the more nurturing of the two. I would not stand with small children. They would be, they would pick them to take them. I, 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 need the, I need the kids to be able to talk and reason, but, like, if something can't talk yet, if it's a small child, like, they gravitate, they just run to my husband, and, and everybody would be like, this is completely flopped of what normal relationships look like. My mother used to come home and say, we need another mother. I can't handle this. He's, Every day. He's going to be the mother when they're little. Small children are incredibly labor so I remember babysitting. I would have paid that lady to come back home at the end of the day, you know, much less. And they were just two fairly well-behaved toddlers. And it was like, it was the best birth control I ever came across. It was like, I am not going to do that by accident. <laughs> well, um, yeah. let's let's talk about uh, Daniel Jackson and his relationships. Did Daniel ever recover from the initial heartbreak? No. You have a comment? Yeah. I think that it was a big barrier to cross for him, but I think over time he finally came to the reali realization that he can't keep living this way, and to truly get over his loss. He has to move on. He has to try at least. And I, you saw that with a few different people, very hand, small handful. But he got at least something out of each one. He tried, and I think that was enough for him because it gave him a little bit of pleasure and a little bit of ease to move on. Uh, see, I argue that he never got over it um, because they reversed the time stream. He didn't get over it until he was stuck on a boat with somebody yeah. for 50 years, and then he finally got over it, and yeah. then they undid that. So he's not over it because he hasn't he hasn't had that opportunity to have something. For him. I guess that what I was what my argument is it was his emo he, he was trying to seem that yeah. way. I got gotcha. you. Do relationships but, work at all on Starkey? No. It's, in fact, in fact I, I don't know if you remember this, but when you asked me to be on this panel and we were talking about it, I was like, so we're just going to get up there and we're going to go, do panel over. Well, <laughs> in that regard, let's stop you viewing relationships as merely romantic. What I think Stargate excelled in was friendship. This was a sh There is nothing stronger and more noble than some beautiful friendships. And my three closest friends from college, we all met uh, around 2000, so we've known each other, we watched each other grow up. And, uh, and actually, uh, one married the other one, so yeah. Uh, we're, we're, yeah, we're still all family. They're, I can, that's, they, they've been stronger and more resilient relationships than all my failed girlfriends in my life. So, let's look at, at the dynamic, like the friendship between Teal, Samantha, and O'Neill, and and uh, Jackson, isn't that a beautiful relationship? Yeah, I think that's what makes me love the show. Actually, is that dynamic? It was more like brotherhood, though, because Daniel, um, he was more like Sam's brother, and that was a really cool take on their relationship. I love watching their <coughs> friendship go to <coughs> brother and sister to. I would die for you any day of the week, and then that was it. And they would always be a mixture of friends, and then, you know, brothers, you can come to me for advice. And, and we, now, unlike uh, so some more contemporary shows like Torchwood, um, they were able to have uh, friendships, and at no point did you, outside the world of fanfic, did you think that <laughs> the three of them were, were doing it? Because you realize this is a real friendship. And I think a lot of shows don't give enough respect to the love that you can have for someone outside of romance, just the true love friends can have for each other. Well, in the, um, one of the earlier episodes when um, O'Neill and Carter had that alien entity that made them like, work at twice the speed or extremely oh, yeah. fast, yeah. in order to break free of it, they had to 
completely tell the, tell the truth. And one of the truths that Carter says is that there is more than just friendship between us, but it can never be anything more. Because if they did, one of them would die. <laughs> 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 well, not only that, they, they, would just, they can destroy yes. their friendship. Yes. Yes. But also, I mean, it, there is a lot of military mm -hmm. um, rules problem with rules with, yeah, ranks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, a couple of nights uh, of, of boats uh, meeting in the night and bumping together is not worth destroying the ocean sometimes. So I think that's what they may have been experiencing. Um, first, you and then you. Yes, yes, ma'am. I think when you have that kind of relationship where you're so close to somebody that you would lay your life down for them and they would do the same for you, it can kind of preclude having a sexual relationship not only within the group but also outside. Oh. Because you're, you're, you're tied so closely to these people that it's hard to share that with anybody else. And I think that kind of leads to why most relationships in the Soviet universe were doomed. Because they had such a close friendship, right? From the very beginning. Well, I think this might be a beautiful thing. The fact that the show came out in, what was it, the, uh, around 94? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Because at the time, as a culture, we weren't that obsessed with sex like we are right now. <laughs> so right now, sex is like the only plot device we have. And like, well, we... Yeah. The aliens are invading, what do we do? Well, you two go in the corner, and uh, you two make out, and um, obviously they'll stop the aliens. I, I've seen everything on sci-fi, that's yes. apparently the plot device now. That's well, a stop Sharknado. Right? But we were able to actually focus, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No. <laughs> Nothing should stop Sharknado except for doing Sharknado. Yeah, yeah. obviously you've, yeah, you've read Aristotle, I see that. Uh, well, we have the benefit that in the 90s, it was, slightly culturally innocent enough that it could start out with a show that was based in friendship as opposed to based in sexuality, as opposed to the very quickly failed universe, mm -hmm. which if they had stayed out of the bedroom, the show could have still been on the air, in my opinion. There are so many weird things they did, like with the stones. Yeah. If they had not done that and not fallen into the trap, the sex trap, and, and just made it a show about a dyna interesting dynamic of these people that shouldn't get along, learning to get along, don't you think the show might have a third and fourth season? I, like, if it, was, if it was a little more of the traditional, more innocent formula? We'd explore more technology. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I think so that... My friend would still have a job. <laughs> <laughs> I think no, seriously, more problems I was in middle school with David Blue, so... Oh. <laughs> I felt really horrible because the show got canceled before I even realized he was on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, well, this is a, a perfect example. Uh, May we go into some slight yeah. detail about what your business is? Oh, yeah. Um, she, she runs an adult-themed uh, cosplay website, which could not truly be appreciated or, uh, in 1994. <laughs> <laughs> now, it's, it's not only acceptable, it's, it's like, okay, it is. It is what it is. Although we still get occasionally people who walk by the booth and are like, sexy, nerdy girls, they can't be real nerds. How's that nerdy? <laughs> Well, at, at least I, I would like to challenge you to play Kirsten in a first-person shooter, and then you'll shut up. Don't you remember the joke in what the very first Revenge of the Nerds movie when they're bonking the cheerleaders yeah. and they're amazed that they're so good, and they're like, "Well, we have nothing to do but think about it." <laughs> you know, there isn't a lot of channeled uh, energy to go into the activity. Well, uh, I like the show because it's about friendship, yeah. and uh, I'll, I'll do, uh, do a confessional. I had a big breakup last Wednesday. It, I had all these great, profound thoughts, and it dawned on me that uh, I've been single for a long time, but I've had friends for a, a lot, for a long time, and these girls seem to last about eight months before something horrible happens. My friends don't lose their minds, and if they, and if they do, they, they, we can, you know, go and watch a couple episodes of cartoons and get over it, because we can. There, it is world shattering. So. Even Starkey and Atlantis, they had great friendships yeah. yes. that lasted. Uh, like McKay, how could you not be best friends with McKay? I mean, come on. <laughs> you just want to hang out with the guy. And uh, the only thing with that show, let, let's go back. To, let's go to Atlantis for a minute. I want. I don't, we don't have a lot of time left because I was trapped. Let's talk about Samantha Carter and what happened on Atlantis. Who wants oh. to hit that one? The one in yellow shall speak. In general, or just 
What happened? <laughs> what happened to her character? What happened? I think that it was it was a big downgrade for me, honestly. Yeah. Um, Tell me more. It was she went from this great portrayed character to this very barely ever seen general. And it's like, hold on, that you used to be like, is this your retirement? Like, I grew. I, she's got great plans. She's got great plans for the facility, um, for leading. But it just they didn't show enough leading with her as in a position for as general. I don't how, think she was. How much of that was actually writing? How much of that was required because she was on another show? I think that a lot had to do with the fact that she she had to split her time, well, which also, ultimately led to her departure. Yeah. Well, so. why did she forget everything about science? I know. <laughs> Yeah, like, what's granola? It's like, so, it, it, yeah, like, she kept, what I want to follow to see on that show is her and McKay, that, that relationship that, that was hinted at in the first couple of seasons of SG-1, if something happened, and years later, she actually grew to respect him, and they fell in love, that'd be kind of neat. I mean, it would be like the most beautiful girl with the geekiest guy. I mean, like, isn't that, like, at least for the guys, like, that's what you want. Like, like, well, he's like, working with Keller. What was that? He's got, he's got Keller. So he's, he's got the hot. Well, she is shiny. Yeah, so, yes. I just want to point out that the one reason why relationships are doomed with those Stargate, yes. the reason why they're doomed in all shows is you can't afford to break, if you have a steady relationship, People will expect to see them. You can't afford, you don't have the time or the money to bring on another actor as a regular. That's why you so often end up, if you want to have romantic activity, it's either they've got to be serial romancers, you know, or everybody dies, depending on, you know, or they hook up with each other. So I mean, in that sense, it's a, it's a construct of the nature of serial TV. Um, and then I've also read some people have, the Stargate team are under basically combat situations frequently. And I mean, I've said it, but you get, very, very tight with the people you're in that sort of relationship, so something you don't have a lot of. And also, it's a secret. They can't tell people. Um, I would find it very hard to be sleeping and living with a guy or a woman, if that was my choice, and not telling them stuff that happened at work that day. It would be a real downer for the relationship. Or that would be like, meet them, stuff. party, sleep with them, and then go and talk about the real <laughs> stuff with the people you work with. That would be weird. Well, we see Samantha struggle with that in her relationship with Pete. Was that his name? Yeah. 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 So that's that's a good point. Mm -hmm. That and successful relationships are just boring to watch. Yeah, they are. That's, that's, and that's why a lot of girls go crazy after eight months because they watch TV shows. Just FYI, that make them think that their relationships supposed to be all drama. You should you should accuse them of that. <laughs> oh, I'll, I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, I'll be like, you need to read a book on codependency and get over it because you're gonna keep doing this to every dude you meet. <laughs> Don't worry, I do the dumping. <laughs> yes. I should we stay a little bit more on the military aspect of the show. And in the military environment, um, when you're in a tight group, and I don't know how many of you are military. You are? I just I know people that have been, okay. I'm not. My dad was but military. Mil I, military I, I fought in the Franco American War. <laughs> <laughs> My dad's a retired four star. Um, in the military environment, you are, like, if you were fighting with a group, you become the best friend just, just by, by definition because you need to trust somebody to keep yeah. your six. Uh, if you are, if you are, even if you have a female member of the group, is becoming a buddy. It's, you, you are, your, your, your mind, at the time at least of a fight, there's, there's no... I don't, I don't know, I'm reminded from uh, when Harry met Sally, that eventually every guy wants to sleep with his female friends, and even the ugly ones eventually. Like, I'm sorry. Like, at some point, it crosses your mind. At least mine. Like, <laughs> I, like man, yeah, I, like, I, I'm bored. I think in an ideal military world, that would definitely be the case, and I do think that that's a big part of the reason that, that uh, Carter and O'Neill like, never look up. Yeah, but there's a lot of but, guys at sea. in reality, if you look at the American military, that's not necessarily always true. Well, but you have to remember active duty combat people are usually supported by four to five people. My dad was in the Air Force for yeah. 20 years. Well, they won, they would never have given him a weapon because he was practically blind. He worked with military staff. They didn't get shot at as a routine basis other than right when they were in the National Guard. Yeah. So they had a lot of nervous energy left over. I would imagine that between while you're in combat, that it would definitely drop down because you're right, you've got to watch each other's back and stay alive. 
When you're out of combat, well, that's when you go to R&R. &R. So I guess maybe they go and do like weasels, and they go together on R&R &R instead of going to whorehouses nowadays in the military. So well, well, speaking okay. of whorehouses, uh, I, have, well, I have a beautiful story to tell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, Great segue. brothel, I shall say, since there's a small child, and children have never heard of such things. <laughs> um, my grandfather was uh, stationed in World War II in uh, North Africa, and he fought against the French quite often. And that's why to this day, well, the French. Before, the French, yes, the French did the fight America, us yeah. in World War II, and that's why, yeah, uh, he was assigned. Actually, so many uh, young men would go to the local brothel that they actually had to have active duty officers there to make sure it was safe. Well, my grandfather had the job of guarding the brothel. <laughs> Needless to say, my grandfather is an experienced gentleman. So there are instances in the military where that can happen. Was he still an active soldier that was able to fight? Yeah. He, he actually hard, hardly ever could talk about how many people he killed in World War II. It, it really bothered him. He was a man's man, but he didn't want to talk about that. But on the other hand, the sheer fact that the men in the military went to a brothel enough that they had to set up a station to guard the brothel, that means, yes, there's a lot of nervous energy, and the military was bright enough to recognize that. Which leads us to ask, in SG-1, what did we not see? What was, what was happening behind the scenes? Was it all the support staff that was the support staff? I'm opening up the audience. Uh, anybody have a guess? No? They don't really hint on uh, the show. Are you, you, are you talking about the whole, like, support staff and the relationship and the friendships with the support staff? You can't leave out Walter, Siler, and Tyler. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
I mean, I think what got a lot of the show was she had that quirky O'Neill sense of humor and was able to push Daniel in ways that we lost when his character went away. Yeah. Um, you know, so to me, I always saw her more of that than the, the sexual support. She, she well, gave Daniel I, I, I don't have a problem yeah. with the character. I'm just saying, in, in general, society often gives women those two choices. Please, please don't kill me. I like the show best when it was Ben Browder, it was Vala, and it was Daniel Jackson, they called me Ori. That was my favorite part of the show. I watched it since it aired, and as soon as the whole Ori plot and they changed the cast a little bit, I'm like, I really like this better. And I know everyone wants to kill me because the Egyptian <laughs> guys so awesome. <laughs> I, Ori were terrifying. I love the thing the Orisai. I'm like, finally it became a show that I like. Now I can embrace it. It's just so awesome. And Vala, like, I want the action figure. I'm going to fight with the laser gun. Like, it's so awesome. And it's Ben Browder. Like, it's the cast of Farscape. How can I not love this? So. Um, I, I just want to, like, I, I, I haven't thought about this at all, but I mean, so we have the, the two main women. Um, why do you think that Stargate didn't really go for any women that are in typical, you know, s s uh, society defined gender roles? Do you think that they were just trying to really eschew any of those typical gender roles? Well, they do. In the beginning, yes. Um, because one of the things I actually found very nice in the beginning, um, because I would classify myself as a feminist, I don't think that's a dirty word, but I'm like the feminist that thinks that the woman firefighter should get that hose upstairs just as fast because if I'm on fire, I don't care. Yeah, I'm straight, if they're coming to my house, they're like, yeah, if I'm on fire, I really don't care. Um, but in the very beginning, one of the things that I found so interesting was Technically, on pretty much any other show you've ever seen, Samantha Carter would have been a dude and Daniel would have been a woman. Yeah. Let's just, da Daniel took on, they had a man take on the traditional female character role of the sensitive one who thinks about other people's feelings and we have to save this indigenous race. Right. And yeah, but they, that's generally, that's, that's what the chick has to do. Yeah, but they only kept him as that character for like a season. And then they cut his hair, then he started doing like no, human he growth hormone. He stayed that character, he, he doing, got a haircut. No, he just started doing <laughs> human growth hormone. All of a sudden, like he became huge. He's like, all of a sudden, he's you know, like, I could fight now. And if you enrage me, I became large and working out. And he was <laughs> better as opposed to who he was. I, I don't mind that he eventually figured out how to fight because well, that, when he dropped that, in that situation, but I, I actually felt yeah. like character-wise, the, the she's just gonna do, he that part of his personality, I don't feel like ever went away. And I found it, that it was interesting that for the first time ever, that character was a guy. Yeah. Well, it, it, they realized that that chick thought he was hot, so they emphasize that, that, that role. That's like, why he got a haircut. Yeah, that's why he got a haircut. Like, I need to go to the it's, gym. It's the same reason Eric got a haircut on True Blood. Because they went, yeah, he looks stupid with long hair. <laughs> I mean, I'm not super familiar with SG-1 or SG-8, but I'm like, I'm like SGU is like one of my favorite shows ever. And I thought they moved kind of, be, for the female characters, they kind of moved beyond the dynamic that we see that you talked about, like the two options thing. Yeah. If you have someone like Park, who's both, like, you see her in, like, a sexual relationship, but she's also, like, I mean, she's a my own character, which is my favorite. And you see her do, like, work, and you see someone like Chloe, who's sort of, like, the friend to everyone, as well as being in a romantic relationship. And even though a lot of those romances didn't work out, they, I, I, don't, I think the women weren't, like, really confined to just having one role. Yes. Yeah. To well, me, it was much more, like, they yeah. had, there were a lot of options. I think, um... You gotta remember, though, with Stargate Universe is that we can't use it as the example because it was canceled quickly. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. whatever they did didn't work. Well, so uh, it might have been awesome to us, but it failed. And and uh, like all these like it, the exceptions to the rules, if they had fit, fit into some uh, archetypes and cliches, it might still be on the air. I think well, universe had the freedom to have um, these characters from all walks of life, like Chloe, the um, the political daughter. Who's everyone's friend yeah, because, because it was an accident. <laughs> yeah, exactly, because it was an accident. And um in SG one and in Atlantis, everyone had a defined role. Um, you know, they had a defined job, so they had to kind of and that's where you get the characters taking on the characteristics of the job, being the super nerdy type or the super badass military type. Um, because that's that's kind of that's especially what Atlantis was was you had the military side and then you had the scientific side. And so it was hard to have the, you know, everyone's friend 
side because you know they needed a job. Well, with the episodic nature of these shows, having characters that complex is difficult. So that's why if you could walk in like that's that person, that's that person, you get it real fast. I'm sorry, I, I love Universe, but I, it, I understand why it's not on the air, just for so many reasons. And one reason was, you could, if you walked in cold on episode 14, you don't know what you're looking at. And that just doesn't work on, t on at least the format they were showing it on TV. If it was back on Showtime, it actually would have worked. Because people tend to watch beginning to end on Showtime. Given it would have a $13 budget like the original SG-1 did, but, and a lot more nudity, but it might still be on the air. But when people on Siffy watch anything, uh, they don't, they don't care. They, they, they show, they, like, they want Sharknado. They want to, like, it's a, tar it's a tornado of sharks. I get it. Like, they want to be able to walk in cold, and just, Universe didn't let us do that because the gender roles were very postmodern. And but as much as I loved it, just, like, after, after watching like your favorite episode of I don't know Jersey Shore, you can't go and watch that. There's a favorite. <laughs> <laughs> the one with the lotion cave. <laughs> I just made that up. Okay, good. I was, I was like, that's a thing. We have we have one minute left. But I think he had a question or a comment. And we're reading the panel lotion cake. <laughs> you, had, you had a question or a comment. I saw you raise your hand while you said. Yeah, my, my problem with the universe was it felt less like a, hey, let's do another Stargate show, and more like, oh, crap, Battlestar Galactic is off the air. We need to replace that. And I think that was, like, the fundamental problem. I think he did aliens. Oh, my gosh. Put some aliens yeah. in the show. Yeah, maybe. Yes, yes. Gosh. Um, my problem is right. The he problem with the universe here. was you said that this was too much of the bad, but you could not show it in the sci-fi. Yeah. It should have been a bit show on the HBO Showtime yeah. or some some adult network. Like, uh, it felt yeah. like it should have been a two and a half hour movie. Yeah, it probably would have worked better. Yeah, yeah. like call it like no, so uh, space. No, but, but if you would have it to space the game? full Stick base game. Big Ooh, adult themes. Awesome. Well, um, we're we're coming to an end of the panel. Um, I bear, I apologize greatly for coming in so late. Um, you can blame um, the transit system of Atlanta. If not, you all the time. You could blame me. Uh, I'd like to thank all the uh, panelists uh, for coming today. Thank you very much. Thank all of you. And if you would like, I have up here free buttons with TARDISes on them, if you'd like to come and get free something. Thank you very much, everyone. And uh, I'm leading another, uh, I'm on the Dr. Geek Science panel today oh, yeah. at four in this room. They're good, you guys, if you uh, aren't yeah. like, committed elsewhere. They're fun. <laughs> <laughs>